Welcome to the Justice Committee's fifth meeting of 2019. We have no apologies. Agenda item one is the decision on taking business in private. Are members content to take items six and seven in private, which is consideration of a draft report on post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012 to be taken in private today and at future meetings, and consideration of the committee's forward work programme. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item three is consideration of a negative instrument, licensing amendment EU exit Scotland regulations 2019, SSI 2019 oblique six. I refer members to paper one, which is noted by the clerk. Do members have any comments? Okay. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to the instrument? We are agreed. Thank you. Agenda item three is consideration of whether a Scottish statutory instrument made under the powers conferred on devolved authorities in the European uh, Union Withdrawal Act 2018 has been laid under the appropriate procedure. The instrument is jurisdiction and judgments, family, civil partnership and marriage, same-sex couples, EU exit, Scotland amendment, etc. Regulations 2019 draft. I refer members to the paper two, which is a note by the clerk, and paper three, which is a private paper. The Scottish Government has indicated that the instrument will be laid under affirmative procedure. The Scottish Government has also categorised this instrument as medium. The, the, the committee will consider the policy content of the instrument at a future meeting. But for the present, do members have any comments? Oh. And is the committee therefore agreed that the affirmative procedure is the appropriate procedure for this instrument and that the categorisation of medium is also the appropriate one? Yeah. We are agreed. Yes. Thank you. Um, the clerks will make arrangements for the report um, to report the committee's views to the Parliament and the Scottish Government. Agenda item four is consideration of two public petitions. I refer members to paper four, which is a note by the clerk, and paper five, which is a private paper. Paragraph five of paper four provides the options available to the committee when considering petitions. Public petitions the committee will consider are firstly PE1458 by, paper, by Peter Cherby um, on, an, on a register of interests of members of Scotland's judiciary and PE1633 by Bill Alexander on private criminal prosecution in Scotland. Taken each in turn, PE1458 calls on the Scottish Government to urge the sorry, calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to create a register of pecuniary interests of judges bill as is currently being considered in New Zealand's Parliament or amend present legislation to require all members of the judiciary in Scotland to submit their interests and hospitality received to a publicly available register of interest. This is the committee's third consideration of this petition. I refer members to Annex A of Paper 4, which details the response received from the Scottish Courts Tribunal Service. The committee is asked to consider what, if any, further action it wishes to undertake in relation to this petition. The options available include keeping the petition open, keeping it open and taking additional actions, such as writing to the Cabinet Secretary and or others, or closing the petition. Can I seek members' views? Uh, Daniel John. Um, so, uh, uh, as uh, when we previously looked at this petition, I mean, I think there are... Um, reasons to examine this. I mean, I, I, everything that I say, I, I bear in mind our duty to uphold the, the independence of the judiciary. However, I don't believe that openness and transparency uh, contradict uh, that. Um, I, I note that the evidence that the Petitions Committee took was some time ago, in 2013, I believe. Um, and therefore, I was wondering whether or not the committee might want to uh, pull together information regarding how other 
countries approach this point, and perhaps also given that we have a new Cabinet Secretary request his views on, on the matter. Um, so those would be my two suggestions at this point in time. Okay. John Finney. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I would fully endorse uh, Daniel uh, Johnson's uh, view on this, and, and, and particularly the comment about the independence. But there's a tension there. There's an obvious tension that there's a not unreasonable, in my view, public expectation that they understand that there are no conflicts of interest. Now, I, I know about the, we know about the, from their papers about the recusal uh, register. That doesn't seem comprehensive enough to me. So the proposal to try and find out um, um, other proposals, particularly perhaps from the New Zealand um, perspective, how that's progressing would be helpful, I think. Okay. Rona. Yeah, really just to say that I, I totally agree with Daniel and, and John on this. I think um, some more information would be helpful. I think it's a really important issue and transparency has to be the key and I think we could do with having more information. Are there any other views from other members? Yes, one just more, one John. Yeah. My understanding is that the bill uh, in, that was before the New Zealand Parliament was, was either withdrawn or defeated, um, but I do understand that, that such a register exists in other jurisdictions, such I think Norway was one that has been mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yes, clearly there's a, a huge issues at stake here and a, a fine balance has to be, has to be struck. Um, I certainly would like to know a little bit more about the recusal um, code or policy, how this works, when a conflict of interest is declared, how much detail is recorded, and if that detail is in the public domain, I think would be quite good to to look at. And I'm getting the, the impression from members that you would quite like to, to at least explore and have a look at any legislation from other countries. Norway was mentioned, New Zealand didn't go forward with it, but it would be good perhaps to look at what they, they said. And as Daniel Johnson rightly points out, we have a new cabinet secretary, so it would be good to seek his views. Are members content to progress then doing these three things? Okay. Right, that's great, thank you very much. With that in mind, then we move on to the next um, petition. Petition 1633 calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to change the law to give the people of Scotland the same legal rights as the rest of the UK by removing the requirement that the Lord Advocate must first give permission before a private criminal prosecution can be commenced in Scotland. In advance of the committee's consideration of petitions PE 1633 today, the clerk sought any views from the petitioner, Mr Bill Alexander, and the Lord Advocate. I refer members to Annex B and um, Paper 4, which details both responses. The committee is asked to consider the submissions from the Lord Advocate and the petitioner and decide what further action, if any, it wishes to take in relation to the petition. The options available include keeping the petition open, keeping it open and taking additional action, or closing the petition. Can I have views from members? Rona. Yes, thanks, convener. Um, can I register an interest in that the petitioner is a constituent of, of mine? Um, I think that there's definitely an issue here. I read the Lord Advocate's letter to yourself, um, convener, and I, and I you know, understand the points he's making. But in the petitioner's submission, um, he, he poses six questions, actually. And of the six questions, I would have thought one in four would have been um, reasonable to follow up in that, given that the health and safety executive is reserved, he says, if the health and safety, safety executive will not be accountable to the Scottish Parliament, then can the relevant committee at the, West, at the Westminster Parliament be asked to inquire from the health and safety executive why they've adopted a different policy in regard to risk assessments and reporting injuries for sporting event workers from all other workers and what evidence they have to support their decision? And then question A4 that he poses is, can the Lord Advocate clarify whether or not the policies of the health and safety executive in regard to sports workers being considered in a different manner to all other workers is compatible with Article 2 of the Human Rights Act? Um, obviously, there are other questions here, but those are the ones that I thought would be um, most pertinent for, for us to follow up. Um, I think it's... You know, I think it's worth pursuing, but I mean, I'm open to comments from other members. Right. Other comments from other members? John Finney. Um, yep. Um, Commissioner, the, the health and safety may indeed be a reserve matter, but I don't think it precludes this committee from writing and cutting out a middle committee, to be perfectly honest. I think it's not an unreasonable, indeed it's a very neutral question, to just establish a policy position with regard 
to, to the, that specific group of workers. So I would suggest that rather than write to a committee at Westminster, that we just write them themselves. I'm sure we'll get a courteous reply. And if for any reason we don't, I'm sure we can follow it up. Can I seek some clarification? Um, it was my understanding that the petition as originally set out um, worked on the basis that the Lord Advocate had to give permission before a, a, a private prosecution go ahead, could go ahead. But the Lord Advocate has now, uh, if my understanding is correct, clarified the position. Um, he will give a view, but he can veto it. There can be an appeal. So effectively, he doesn't have to give opinion, but obviously, uh, he doesn't have to give permission, but obviously his opinion carries great weight. Mm -hmm. Is that the case? Uh, happy to answer that question. Um, the original petition did indeed, in, in the terms of it, cover the question about the, whether the permission of the Lord Advocate or not was required for um, a private prosecution. That was the original uh, terms. I think we've set that out in various papers and the Lord Advocate's letter to the committee um, touches upon that point as well. Yes, so the difficulty for me um, here is we've been given a petition, the premise in which it was set hasn't actually proved to be the case and therefore for me I, I would find some difficulty in um, then carrying on and making more in inquiries. It almost seems to me like a new petition perhaps should be submitted if there were other issues that they wanted to follow up, but um, I'll defer to, to members' views. Is that something you'd considered, Rona, at all? Ian? Well, just as, as the clerk was explaining it, that was going through my mind that, you know, that, that might be a possibility. Um, but, I mean, assuming that it couldn't be carried on in, the, in this particular petition, I don't know if, if that's, you know, administratively possible to do that. I think that the difficulty, again, I would have is it's setting a precedent. OK, well, the, the assertion in the prison didn't prove to be the case, but we'll go on and look at other things. And if we did that, then where, where do we end? Yep. Um, so in view of that, would, would we be content to close this petition in terms of the, the question has been answered? He doesn't, the Lord Advocate doesn't have um, to give permission. He certainly will give a view or can choose to give a view, and that will carry a lot of weight, but he can't actually refuse permission. And if there are other issues that the petitioner wants to bring up, perhaps a fresh petition is the way to do it. Well, I mean, I, th I think that the points he's raised in this one are, are really important in, in, with regard to the safety mm -hmm. of sports workers, so, um, but be you know... A, a different petition to do it. Possibly. Daniel, then, John. I mean, is there perhaps a middle way? Because I, I, I accept your points, convener, about the, the, the premise of the petition essentially having been answered. However, having had uh, issues flagged to us by whatever means, it surely open to us to, to ask questions. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not, while we may choose to close the, the petition, whether simply asking this question of the, the HSE um, and indeed uh, question four, to the Lord Advocate may be, may be a relevant thing for the committee to do, regardless of where the suggestion came from. John? I, I would agree with Daniel there. I think particularly about this legislation, the potential is that you have both uh, criminal and civil matters originating from it. We've previously dealt with issues around when we did our previous session about fatal accident inquiries and the role that health and safety legislation played in that. So out of at the very minimum, idle curiosity in my part. I, I think it would be helpful to understand, albeit that we could, you know, the terms of the petition could be closed. Perhaps, um, yeah, that is the halfway house. Close the petition, but write and get the answers that the petitioner seeks to these questions mm -hmm. that really aren't kind of directly to his original petition, but still addresses the point series in that he gets the response. Are we content with that approach? That's lovely. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, we now move in. Oh, no, sorry, we don't. Agenda item five is feedback from the meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on the 31st of January. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments and or questions. I refer members to paper six, which is a note by the clerk, and invite John Finney to provide that feedback. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um And since it's quite a detailed paper, I'll perhaps 
try and summarise some of the points, rather, because it is, it is in the public domain, nonetheless. And that meeting was on the 31st of January, and we were considering Police Scotland's draft budget for 2019-20 and the Chief Constable's priorities for the coming year. Um, and to that end, we, we he heard some detail from the, the Chief Constable about the preparation made for, uh, uh, by Police Scotland in relation to um, Brexit. Significantly, in terms of um, officer numbers, they were the delaying the reduction of 300 police officers, which uh, this, this was intended to deal with efficiency savings. And in addition to that, they were accelerating the uh, recruitment of 100 new additional officers, thereby uh, having 400 police officers to be available to support Police Scotland's response to all Brexit situations. Um, and we did hear that that could be elsewhere in um, the United Kingdom, indeed, that there are reciprocal arrangements with other forces there. And that this was the biggest short-term demand that we're facing, not least because of the uncertainty aspect. Um, with regard to specific questions ab about um, Brexit, um, the longer-term policing risks we heard from the Chief Constable would be the loss of access to EU-wide mechanisms such as Europol, Eurojust and the European Arrest Warrant. Uh, but he did say that work is already underway to build bilateral arrangements with, with other countries, and that was already in place. We talked about the ICT uh, strategy, um, and specifically on the cyber kiosks. There was an acknowledgement by the Chief Constable that Police Scotland had not gone about that properly. Um, although events conspired that we didn't, on the day, have... Um, uh, it was that morning that legal advice came in, we're told from the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service, about the legal basis in which these cyber chaos can be used. That's not yet available, but will be shared with the committee. But we had an assurance that the rollout wouldn't take place unless there was absolute certainty about the legal basis. There was a number of questions around the capital budget, uh, um, and it was felt inadequate. Indeed, the... the um, equates to only 40 to 50 per cent of what a force of Police Scotland size would anticipate. And it was felt that without additional capital, it wouldn't realise the full benefits of some of the revenue, and there would also be challenges for the fleet and estate. And these challenges will become acute. We heard how the VAT um, money is now mainstreamed. And uh, the other issue that was discussed in some detail was the community police officers funded by local authorities. There's about 145 of them. Um, and um, the Chief Constable stated it was his ethical duty to ensure they continue to undertake community policing functions within these local authorities. Um, however, there is a challenge if that uh, funding was to be removed. Um, and uh, I think that's... Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Can you... Do members have any questions or, or comments? It was a very good um, evidence session with the, the Chief Constable. I think you know we're all pleased to see that there's a huge, vol huge volume of mobile devices um, being used for the, the frontline police, but concerns most certainly still exist about the the, um, the, the slow progress, I think, in the funding of the, the IT system, which is a tool obviously the police need, and about the fleet and um, the estate uh, deficit and, and the need really to to address that. But, yeah, there was certainly very worthwhile, and, uh, I think, an encouraging session with the Chief Constable. Um, oh, yes. Uh, before we move into um, private session, can we record Liam MacArthur's um, apologies, which apparently were submitted after all? <laughs> right, that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 19th of February, when we will continue our consideration of our, report, of our draft report on our post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. We now move into private session.